Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about something that is near and dear to my heart, and that is equitable search. So what does equitable search mean? It means that you can use your own language, the language you are the most comfortable using to do a search. And you might say, well, yeah, Google does that. No, what Google does is it takes the most popular ways that people are talking about things and it adds that to their knowledge graph. The thing is, not everybody's part of that majority, right? You don't always call this thing that you drink in the morning Java or coffee or your cup of joe. There are a lot of different reasons that you would have different words for coffee depending on how you grew up and the people that were in your life. All of these things add up to how you talk about things in the world. And if you owned a premier coffee shop with a lot of different types of coffee in your catalog, you might want to have different variations of how to discuss and talk about these things. So this is the first video in a mini series that I am doing all about equitable search. This first video is going to be outlining what is the problem and why should we care? The second video is going to be talking about how do you actually gather the natural language, not natural language processing, the natural language of your users to add to your taxonomy. The third video is going to be talking about how do you gather the relationships between different things that you can add to something like a knowledge graph. And that video may also cover how to add it to your knowledge graph, or I might have a fourth video talking about in depth. We'll see how long filming lasts. My intent with this video is to really inspire you to take the first step into equitable search because it's not fair, it's not right for us to put up barriers to entry for people that may not know the right word for something. So it's not something that's going to change overnight, but we can all do a little bit of this in our own institutions and hopefully we can share this with others so that they can start to work on this too. All right, so with that, let's go get started. All right, so the icebreaker. So what labels would you choose for this image if you were trying to either index it or search for it? How would you do that? So the reason I, I start with this is because we often start the conversation with taxonomies with, okay, you have words or you get words from your text or whatever assets that you have. How do you structure them? How do you organize, right? Like that's usually what we jump to. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Do you know how your users think about things when they're searching? Do you know what words they use when they're doing searches or when they're doing their own tags on assets? I usually start there. And what we're gonna walk through is you all use different verbiage to identify what this is. So out of all of those, which one would be the preferred label? Well, what we end up doing, and this is something that is very traditional in the information science, and that is we find the canonical, right? We figure out, okay, everybody uses all these different words for something, but what are we all going to agree to call this, right? That's what our preferred label is. Here's the thing. I'm not saying we get rid of the official real term for something. We we still do need that. I mean, or else we would have chaos. We would never be able to find anything. But what ends up happening is when we use the word preferred and then we use alt label, even the labels that we use in information science are a sort of exclusionary. Right. So if I said that the preferred word for this is Garfield, but you never even knew Garfield was a cartoon, you just call this cat. I just said your words aren't preferred. How would that make you feel? Right. <laughs> make you feel kind of crappy. What if you're in a situation where you have studied and you have so much blood, sweat and tears put into a dissertation and you get out, you have a PhD and you are a newly minted expert in something and then you get your first job and then you are tasked with doing 
research in something that you never did in your PhD. But hey, you're an aerospace engineer, right? You should know how to search for these things, even if you haven't studied Internet of Things, because that's a new technology. You should know how to do this. Are you going to know the right words? Are you going to know what those right words are? Are you going to know how to uh, search on the preferred labels for something? Probably not. It's going to make you feel embarrassed and not so good when you're doing your research. Same thing can happen to somebody that has 30 years experience. This actually happens quite a lot. I use engineering, STEM, and medical examples a lot when I'm talking about making search and taxonomies more equitable because I think a lot of people default to say, well, medical is one of the number one most um, standardized taxonomies, MESH, standardized. Everybody uses the same words for everything. And even if they don't, we know heart attack means myocardial infarction. We know that, but it still happens, right? Like you can have a new nurse or a new doctor or, or a doctor that has a lot of experience, but they never knew what food was <laughs> until mm -hmm. now. And so what happens is by using preferred label, and even if you have the most common synonyms, right? you're still excluding people because you're not including their natural language. So when I say natural language, I don't mean NLP, natural language processing. I really mean what Hobbes uh, defines as discourse, right? The discourse, the way that we talk to each other. So if I said, I'm going down to the bank, you as humans don't know if I mean riverbank, financial bank, snow bank, you don't know what I mean. But if I say, oh, I need to go down to the bank and get some checks. But well, now you might think financial institution, right? Our backgrounds, everything that, that makes us us, <laughs> even if you speak English, even if you had gone to the same school that I did, we are still going to have different ways of expressing what we're searching for. And a lot of studies that I have done have, have shown if you start to include more natural language, I'm not expecting all of you to just do like I drew genie ding and everything is like natural language. I'm not expecting that, but it behooves us to continue to chip away at adding more natural language to your taxonomies because on average it increases the search satisfaction of your users by up to 40%. And the reason for that is because people don't want to feel like their words aren't good enough. They don't want to feel like oh, I got to figure out what my my librarian or my asset management or my taxonomist told me I have to use, right? They want to use the words that they are more comfortable with. And it's up to all of us in this industry to be those data stewards, right? The bridge between the assets and the preferred, more um, machine readable um, canonical form and your end user, which are not using either of those things usually when they're doing a search. So that's actually where knowledge graph is, is, is a beautiful thing because it used to be to get this into a system would be like pulling teeth and you'd have to do all these weird things, but now you can just make a relation and you can categorize all of these things together without having to reinvent the wheel because that's what linked data does too. It just connects those things together for you. So why are we doing this? There's a lot of messiness with language. So when you grew up, you had family, you had friends, you had a neighborhood, you had a geographic location, you had a culture. All of those things build what's called your mental model. So that moment in time where you're like, What's the word for that thing? When you do that, you're reverting back to the mental model that you developed up to the age of nine. Everybody does it, no matter where you're from or who you are or what language you speak. It's, it's how our brains work. And so if we can tap into some of that, I don't want to say subconscious because that's not, that's not accurate. It's more of that um, implicit information that we're all kind of gathering as humans constantly, if we can gather some of that and actually put it into practice with our taxonomies and our knowledge graphs, you're going to have a much better search experience. Been talking about ontologies and taxonomies and knowledge graphs 
What does that all mean? The way that I describe what the difference between a taxonomy, the whole way to knowledge graph, is it's all about the relationships. People start to say, well, is it a class? Is it an instance? Is it an RDF? Is it for, just forget about that stuff right now, okay? <laughs> it's all about the relations. It's that context. That's the real difference between all of these things. So when you're looking at taxonomies, they are traditionally those things that you see on e-commerce, broader and narrower. It's usually all you have. Child, parent, that sort of thing. Class, subclass. After that, you start to get into more connective tissue, more of more context than that. And that's where you start to get into uh, broader, narrower, see also, use for, right? So now you're like, oh, now I don't only know that something is uh, a more specific version of something else. I now know that there's a whole group of synonyms and also that there are things that are very similar to it. So now I'm adding more context. The next step after that is ontology, where you are adding things Again, from those first two steps, each of these build on each other. You're starting to add things like is a, has a, part of. And the reason these these are also are in knowledge graphs too, right? Um, and there's a whole slew of other things that ontologies are good for. But again, just focusing on those relationships. Once you get into ontology and you start to say is a, that's talking about more of that grid-like view where you're you're orienting yourself. You're saying, I am Ashley. And I am sitting in a chair in Boston. You see how these are like orienting, like where am I in relation to the rest of the world? That's essentially what this is doing. The most core relationships are is a, has a, part of. After you get past that, that's where you really get into knowledge graph, where you're not only just saying, here's all of the connections of, of one entity or one concept, but now you're saying, how is it? even more specifically related to something else. So is it capital city? Is it adverse effect if you're talking about drugs? All of those things add up to a knowledge graph. It's when you sit down with a car salesman, for instance, and you say, what's your secret? How do you sell cars? And then the maybe the person will say, well, you know, if somebody walks in and they're wearing like really shiny shoes, I've noticed that those people are really um, interested in high-end luxury vehicles. So I, I point them over there. That thing they just said, that's knowledge. You can capture that with a relationship. You see how that knowledge can be captured? That's something that that car salesman would never think to do because it's their secret sauce. But that's what sharing knowledge is all about, is trying to figure out like what is so unique and special about all of us and then capturing it so that the rest of us can benefit from it. Why even bother with the exercise that we're going to do today with um, card sorting or extracting of natural language? Because you don't necessarily have to do a manual card sort. You can do this in an automated way. Well, there's a few reasons for that. So are you all familiar with the linked data cloud? But it's essentially this giant cloud of all of the open data sources that are out there that are usually free to use, at least under Creative Commons. Why not just use that? I hear people say this all the time, engineers especially. They're like, eh, I don't need a taxonomy. I can just use, use Wikidata. Oh. That's good, that's fine. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> so first of all, um, even if you, let, let's let's take it to Library of Congress subject headings, because I know uh, a few of you are from that, that neck of the woods. Was that made for your use case? Even if you work in a library, was it made for your specific use case and your specific collection and your specific users? No, it was not. And that's the same with all of these. They are, they are free and open because they were made to be generally used. So it's not the end point, it's a starting point. You also have to keep in mind if the data source is open like a wiki data you're going to get the good the bad and the ugly you have to be very careful especially if you're using any of these for machine learning purposes mm -hmm. we all know what happened when someone trained a machine on twitter you don't want that to happen that is in wiki data so be careful <laughs> the other thing is um when you are using these open data sources there are two good rules of thumb and that is um, if you want to, to, to decide to use one of these, 
and you are in the STEM or more scientific, you need to look at when is the last time that data source was updated. If it was older than two years ago, you probably shouldn't use it because that means people are not maintaining it and it's not being used enough for anyone to care about it, which means you probably shouldn't care about it either. Um, if you are in the humanities or legal or you know something like that, you probably can get away with five years um, because those things don't change as quickly and often as something in the sciences. But again, you do want to make sure it's not past you know that five year mark because again, what are you getting? It's probably outdated. You also have to keep in mind some of these are using um, I'm going to say outdated ways of doing things. And I just feel so silly when I talk to folks that are still using these very um, old school ways of doing information science. Dog dash dash food dash dash recipe. That's a literal subject heading in the Library of Congress. <sighs> Who would ever use that? <laughs> when you're driving around, what's the thing called that you're driving around? Is it your car or is it your automobile? It's probably your car. So it's it it does feel a little silly how sometimes we're trying to make these very formal labels and nobody uses them. <laughs> nobody uses that wording and we don't need to feel guilty and we don't need to feel like we we're not allowed to use natural language that it's it's not controlled who knows it's slang. I, I can't stand when people tell me it's slang. Guess what? We speak in slang, every one of us. Nobody walks around, you know, talking as if they are um, writing a research paper. That's the other thing. A lot of people say, well, I can get the natural language. I'm just going to mine all the full text. That is absolutely one way to do it. But don't be fooled. That is not the natural language because if you talk to that researcher, they are not going to talk the same way because that researcher wrote a paper and then an editor looked at it and then peer reviewers looked at it and they told you to change things. So it's not natural anymore, right? And when you are writing a, an email to your boss, are you going to talk to your boss like you would talk to me? <laughs> Probably not. So just keep in mind, those are all in a semantic way. They are natural language ways of talking. But if you're trying to get at that discourse analysis, that discourse, how you would talk to each other, that's not really going to get you the full way there. It's a good place to start or to supplement, not the end result. OK, so why are we even talking about this? Um, I mentioned that once you start to add more natural language to your models, you are going to get more satisfaction. And that's because people are going to feel more included, right? So search engines, tags, taxonomies, they all look at the majority. You're going to go with what the majority is using because you're trying to reach and cover the broadest application of your users, right? Well, what about those users that aren't the majority? If you're looking at this from a natural language perspective and you put a pipeline in place where you can regularly refresh that natural language, you are attempting to break down those barriers to entry that we are all doing by only having one preferred label or only looking at the common synonyms that everybody else is using. All right, so there are a few different ways you can get at the natural language. The first is a traditional card sort. So there's open and closed card sorts. I believe better uh, more in open card sorts where you give um, these clusters and, and different cards of, of things and then your users put a label. The um, no code taxonomy video that I did is an open card sort essentially. So if you wanna look at an example of how that works, that's a good one. And if you want to do a card sort, a lot of us are not physically with our teams or, or the people that we work with or our users, but you can use automated means to do this. Like I said, you can search uh, your search logs, you can mine your search logs, you can um, mine your full text, you can mine um, social media platforms. If you're doing things on a digital asset management, if you're doing um, your tagging for internal users, you don't have end users that are you know, customers. 
Uh, you can mine from, if they have like a Yammer, you can start to mine from the Yammer feed to figure out like what words your users are using. So there's, there's some automation that you can do with this. So when you are doing automation, here are some ways to do that. Um, you can look at node attributes. So those are a lot of the things that we're going to be pulling out of the prompts today. There's also the structural features. So that's the hierarchy and the different relationships and then node embeddings. So if you look at the hierarchy and, and node characteristics of this thing, this cluster of things over here, it, how is it related to the cluster of things over here? This one is really good for disambiguation. So let's take Java, right? What is this, Panera? I can't even tell anymore. I drink so much coffee. <laughs> um, if, I, if I grew up calling this Java, right? Well, Java is a programming language. It's also an island. But if you look at the structure and the different characteristics of those three clusters, you're going to know they're different. There's going to be some similarity, but you're going to know they are distinct concepts. So that's one way of doing it. Um, if you're trying to do more of that traditional card sort, uh, you can do surveys in something called optimal sort. They have really good pricing and you can just spin up a project and then stop paying after the project. So that's another one to go and check out. Or you could do what we're going to practice today, and that is a bi-directional card sort. And if you go and Google that, you won't find it anywhere because uh, I, I built that method. So there you uh -huh. go. <laughs> and by the way, this is something that I again use in my day job. Um, I use this internationally. Um, as well, I use this to gather the natural language of people that do not speak English natively. Because if you do a direct translation, does anybody remember when uh, the Olympics were in China and they did direct translations of street signs? They were hilarious. They were terrible. <laughs> That's what happens when you do machine translations. It's very popular and those are getting a lot better than they used to. But when you're dealing with human people doing search, you need to make sure that you have their natural language. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Make sure that you stick around for part two. I am also going to make all of these videos available as a playlist, and I will put that playlist in the description below if you want to watch all of them in sequence once they are all posted. All right, so with that, if you have any questions on this, please don't hesitate to reach out. You have my email description below and you have YouTube where you can ask these questions to the whole community. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.